What's up, brother and sisters? It's your brother, G World 7 underscore D. Here I have the book, Civilization in Ancient Egyptians, The Great Water, by Katenga A. Bongo. Now, this is an African guy who wrote this. Um, before I get started, you know, I, like I said in my video earlier, that we're going to have to just ignore some of these Negroes who don't believe that melanated people, black people, had the intellectual capacity to sail around the world. And some people just believe that you was brought over as a slave. They quote idiots like Henry Louis Gates, who's a sellout. You know, and all he does is date and marry white women. And the guy really seems to have a deep level of self hatred. It's sad. Or idiots like Umar Johnson, who's Cuban, and he's very he's been very disrespectful to our people and our culture. And he just shows how ignorant he is, man. <laughs> that guy is truly ignorant. And then you get people like Sarah Sutton Seti and these other goofball Pan-Africans who a lot of them are not of Aboriginal Black American heritage. But in his case he continues to quote Dr. John Henry Clark. You know, misinformation, wrong information that comes from Dr. John Henry Clark. And yet he sits up there and bashes people who identify themselves as Aboriginal or Indian or Indigenous being as to this land. The original people here in America were so-called black people. Period. I mean, it's just, I'm, like I said, I'm breaking this down, but I'm going to break it down even further. I'm going to talk about the climate. It's impossible climatic, climate-wise for pale-skinned people to be over in this region, particularly the southern part of the region. This is older than the northern part of the region because they would not be suitable to the damn weather. All right. I'm going to read this book. I'm going to go to, go to page... Uh, I'm going to say 169. I'm going to read a little bit. All right. It's called The Rise of the Warrior Empire. The first warrior empire to emerge in South America at the dawn of the war era was the Warrior Empire. Some historians spell the name Warai and others spell it Horai. But when most people consider the ancient empires of South America, the Incas generally come to mind. Little do they know that the Incas were actually the most recent, or the final, empire to rule in South America. Before the Incas, Dinkas, there was the Moshe Empire. And before the Moshis, there was the Ware Empire. The rise of the Ware Empire was a major defining event in South America that changed the culture of the pyramid civilization. The Ware the Empire started as a small kingdom, and over a span of more than 1,000 years, it gradually expanded into a large warrior empire. At the height of its glory, it dominated most of South America for about 400 years, because it was the first major warrior empire. It took a long time to conquer and annex neighboring tribes. This new warrior empire played a major role in shaping South American culture, in the post-human sacrifice era. The Ware Empire also played a major role in shaping African culture in the post-Egypt era. The Ware tribe was a small but very industrious tribe of master cloth weavers that had existed for thousands of years. The original South American tribes that came to North Africa 5,000 years earlier to build ancient Egypt included the Warais. The Ware tribe may have been responsible for the invention of the loom. The Warais created the best form of fabric in South America for thousands of years. Clove, excuse me, cloth, clove weaving was a major occupation of Ware men and women. Ware fabrics were woven in a multitude of colors and patterns that produced a very beautiful appearance. The Kintic robe is a hallmark creation of the Ware tribe and serve as a symbol of affluence in the Ware tribe. The Ware chiefs and dignitaries wore Kinti robes to all fashions. The Kinti robe has persisted into present times and still serves as a symbol of affluence in some African and Native South American Indian tribes. The Warais were also excellent pyramid builders. The Ware pyramids were relatively small in size but very beautiful. The Warais emphasized appearance over size in everything that they did. The Ware fabrics and Ware pyramids tended to be aesthetically pleasing. 
when warfare started in South America, the Warais were the first to take full advantage of the new phenomenon. Warai men were excited about invasions and wars. Warai young men spent lots of time learning the art of war, clove weaving, which once dominated Warai culture, was regulated to women and older men. In the Warai language, the word for warrior was Asanti. Some tribes pronounced it Ashanti. The Asantis were led by the Ohana, the Ohana warrior leader, was also the king of the Ware Empire. It was the Ohana who led the Ashantis on invasions. The Ware started by conquering and annexing neighboring smaller tribes. At the beginning, they avoided larger tribes. After conquering another tribe, the Ware subdued the old cultures and enforced their own way of life, forbidding any practice of the former culture, losing all traces of the written culture that was conquered. The chiefs of the conquered tribes were replaced with appointees of the Warai king. The Warais also placed representatives in each of the conquered villages to monitor the activities of the appointed chiefs and the elders. When the empire began large, became large, excuse me, the Warais started conquering some of the larger tribes. However, the Warais never wanted to risk the empire by trying to annex very large tribes. <clears throat> They used diplomacy to avoid any confrontation with the very large tribes. The Oray expanded the empire to cover most of what is present-day Peru, Heru, and beyond. There is strong indication from archaeological evidence that the Waray Empire started around 1000 BC. The Waray Empire expanded slowly, establishing new centers both in the Peruvian highlands and on the coast. The capital of the Ware Empire was located near the present-day city of Ayacucho, Peru. The capital city was strategically located at the point of intersection of three major trade routes. Ware cities were made up of large rectangular buildings that were laid out in strict grid patterns that resemble most of today's city block structures. At the height of the Ware Empire, there were several Ware outposts throughout the empire. Each outpost was a complex of administrative, storage, and military buildings. The Ware constructed an extensive road system that later became the basis for the Moshe and Inca system of transportation. The Warais also developed a complex irrigation and terrain system that opened up new lands for cultivation, especially in maize and cocoa growing belts. It was at that time that maize agriculture became profitable. Bronze metallurgy was started at the height of the Ware Empire. And bronze, along with gold, silver, and timbaga, were used to make tools and weapons. At the start of the Warai Empire, the practice of head cutting was taken to new heights. Warai men prided themselves in the number of enemy heads they collected during their lifetime, and manhood was measured by it. When a man died, his enemy heads were placed in the tomb in which he was buried. In particular, the greatness of the Warai king was measured by how many human heads were placed in the tomb along with his body. When the Warai king died, <clears throat> every tribal chief in the Warai empire was required to provide human heads for the burial of the king. The heads that were sent for the burial of the king had to be fresh. If a chief did not provide enough heads, the Warai, was sent, Warai sent invaders to the village to take the heads themselves often including the head of the chief. The Warai buried the king in an elaborate, well-decorated, and unmarked underground tomb. The design of the tomb for burying Warai kings were inspired by the design of Tutu's tomb touched about a thousand years earlier. The new burial tomb was constructed in the capital city at the height of the Warai Empire. The designers as well as the builders came from the conquered tribes. After, tri excuse me, after the tomb was constructed, all dead Warai kings were buried in that tomb. The head-cutting activity that occurred whenever the Warai king died spurred a new cultural arrangement in which South America, in much of South America, excuse me. While the Warai king was alive, there was a peace throughout the empire. When the Warai king died, it was kept a secret until there were enough heads to bury him with. Often, thousands of fresh human heads were used to bury the king. Villages invaded each other in order to have enough heads to take the capital city. 
Head stealing also became a common practice. When a red king died, men from one tribe would often go and hide in the bushes along trade routes of other tribes. Unsuspecting passerby were kidnapped, killed, and beheaded. In time, it became commonplace for people to abandon their homes and flee far into the forest whenever the Ori king died, in order to avoid headhunting. People fled into the forest whenever there was a rumor that the Ori king was sick. They came out of the forest and returned to their homes after the king had been buried. Some of the people sought refuge in their larger tribes that were not part of the Ori empire. <clears throat> as bad as it sounds, the head-cutting practice was actually good for the Ori empire because it kept the populations under control. <laughs> this was still a period in which fertility rates were very high in South America and infant mortality did not exist. However, it was head cutting practice that led to the demise of the Warrior Empire. The Warrior Empire excuse me, the Warrior Empire collapsed suddenly around A D four hundred after about fourteen hundred years. I don't want to go go further down. I'm going to emphasize this right here. But this is something we the collapse of the Warrior Empire. At the height of its glory, the Warrior Empire dominated most of South America for about 400 years. One of the larger tribes that the Warrior avoided for more than a thousand years was the Moshe tribe. The Moshe tribe had existed in South America for thousands of years. The earliest South American tribes that came to North Africa 7,000 years ago and built ancient Egypt, including Moshe's. The Moshis were also one of the first tribes to set up a settlement in Eden. The Moshi tribe was one of the largest tribes in South America for thousands of years. The Moshi were very peaceful and deeply religious people. The Moshis hated war and the killing of humans. At the start of the Warre Empire, the Warres tactically used diplomacy to avoid any confrontation with the Moshis. Some of the smaller tribes relocated to Moshe land and became part of the Moshe tribe in order to be protected from the Rore. The Moshe tribe quickly expanded. That all changed when, about 1400 years after the Rore Empire started, the Rores decided to conquer and annex the Moshe. It turned out to be a fatal mistake. They succeeded in defeating the Moshe in battle, and several Moshe people were either beheaded or taken into slavery. However, the Moshe king, who had escaped, was able <clears throat> was able to persuade several of the tribes who were part of the Warre Empire to join the Moshe and take on the Warres. In the epic battle that would forever after, well, excuse me, in the epic battle that would forever alter the course of South American African history, the Moshe defeated the Warres. The Moshe Warre War was the most defining war not only in South American history but also in African history. When the Moshe's defeated the Warres, they destroyed the Warre Empire. The Moshe's hated Warres because of their senseless killing of humans for heads. The Moshe's went to a lot of trouble to destroy everything that remained, reminded them of the Warre Empire. They also expelled the Warres from South America. Most of the Warres fled to Africa. At the time that the Warres fled from South America, Ancient Egypt had collapsed, but Nubia had emerged as a successor to Egypt. Most of the Warais ended up in Nubia. Some of the Warais fled to West Africa. Other Warais fled to the islands and joined the island people who had fled from South America to escape Warais invasion. The destruction of the Warais empire was sudden and it was quick. The Warais who stayed beyond, behind in South America became part of the new Moshe empire and were subjected, subjected to strict rules. The Warais were forbidden to kill any human for any reason. The Warais, the Warais king had to go to home of the Moshe king at least once a year with presents to pay homage to the Moshe king. Often the Warais king would stay in the house of the Moshe king for several days. The 2,000 year old feud between Moshes and Warais have persisted into present times and still exists in in parts of West Africa, Central Africa, and Southern Africa. Now, I'm going to stop right there, man. I had to mention over and over again how the blacks were migrating back and forth and how they had various different wars. What I just read to you was a war between the Warais and the Moshe's. Out of the Moshe's, 
view the war rays as being barbaric in their ways. With the head hunting. When the king dies, they go look for the head of uh, various subjects or even different tribes. Smaller tribes around the area. Alright. So they're basically attacking lesser warlike tribes. But when they went against the Moshe's, then that was their demise and that was part of their fall. Now, you constantly hear stupid Pan-Africans, man. Like the idiot Umar Johnson. He, he's extremely ignorant. And he doesn't know our history. He's Cuban. Remember, he's Cuban. He had no business speaking our people's history, man. That, that dude needs to be dealt with. But the point is that Here's in, um, I done showed this picture before of a Moshe ruler, all right? This is obviously a damn Negro. Look what he's wearing, too. Look at the geometric type patterns on there, all right? This is obviously a damn Negro, man. To say that, that, that most of our people came over into some slave ship, that's ridiculous. And, and this is from the book, The Search for El Dorado. I showed this book before. I didn't, no, I didn't show you this one. Before. This is more of an anthropology book. It's called Ancient South America. Would you look at that. Now I'm gonna to turn to page. I'm gonna say one. I had it 169. All right. This is more of an archaeological book. All right. Oh shoot. I, damn. I just had it. 169, 168, or 159. Uh, I just had it. 166. Oh shoot. I just had that that picture that I want to show. It was one. Right about 196. It's not the picture that I wanted to show because I just had it. One, yeah, I think this is it right here. Yeah, it is right here. Ooh, man, you start forgetting the heat. You line up, you always you try to pre plan. Here's a picture of a motion. All right. Look at like the wrap he's wearing. Like, like you see a lot of muzzles wear around his neck. All right. Also, see the little cat like figure on his head. That was big in Egypt, too. The cat. And these, like I said, the big earrings. He has a little uh, around his head, so like a headband around here. And this is sort of like disc right here. This could be like little lotus flowers, whatever. All right? But this is sort of like big old earrings. And this is like a little wrap around his head. Could be what you see a lot of muslin wear. Like a scarf around him. Around this is obviously was a Negro, man. Dobbs was a Negro. All right? But you look at him, man. This, this, this was the Moshe. All right? I'm going to go to page... Another page, we'll go to 229. All right, there's various different pictures in this book. All right. Here's another uh, image of the Moshe. Moshe. Moshe, excuse me. Here's another picture right here. You can see it. Let me get it better. Okay. You can see the picture. Yeah, I'm blowing it up a little bit. Here's a brother. All right. Obviously, a brother. It's believed that he may be an entertainer, a musician, whatever, or ancient healer. Cure, help people with sickness. Take a good look at him now. You, you obviously, okay, well, let me get out, get in focus. You obviously tell he's a Negro, but look at what he's wearing his head. So, like a little kufi or type of his head and the big earrings on the side. Uh, this is the Moshi, all right? These are the Negroes that was here in America, man. I keep explaining this over and over again. Is that our people had gold-plated streets here in America. We had a form of rail system, railroad system, before Europeans got here. We had our own little highways that transported, you know, within different cities. Within the city and out of the city. We had the various different mounds. Several million miles that were here in America. We had all that here in America, man. We we had a great civilization here. To relegate our history and just believe in that, the half-older brother, Mansa Abu Bakare II, sailed over here to the Americas. And that and that is the only proof that so-called blacks might have been here. It's ridiculous, man. It, it is, because the Egyptians were here. And when you hear Negroes talking about, okay, that the Mali sailed over here and they mixed in with the Siberian people, that's nonsense. Because the original people, so-called Negro people, were here for hundreds of thousands of years. 
the Siberian people didn't even exist. They are basically, I said this before, the people who you see in Central Southern Africa are known as the Khoisan. They are basically the progenitors, uh, people who predated the so-called Asian people. It's obviously, they mixed in, some of them mixed in with so-called albinoid white people and some Australoid blacks to get what you call the modern-day um, Asian. Because all you gotta do is look at the Pacific, uh, not Pacific, the Philippines, Indonesia. You still see an indigenous Aboriginal black population. Where some of them have those folded eyes, and then you see the the paler people. They have pale skin and straighter hair. But when you look at a lot of them, is that some of them will have some of the lips and noses that you find are so-called Negro people, because those people have been highly, heavily amalgamated, bleached out. So that tells you right there that so-called the original so-called Siberian people were nothing but a bunch of mulattoes originally when they came, when they started coming over here. Even though the original so-called people of those type of features were darker skin to come over here. So we, we really got to really understand and comprehend our true history. When I listen to Pan-Africans, I can tell you that they've been, they not only, they're not educated or they've been heavily miseducated and they're very ignorant. And you hear it in Uman Johnson. And he's very disrespectful to our ancestors, man. He's truly an ignorant dude. Ignorant man, who I believe is on drugs. I believe that guy's on drugs. All the sniffing he does. I think he has some psychological issues, man. Mental issues. He's And he's made his money off of black Americans. He made his money off of black Americans, yet he insults us. Man, that dude, got, he needs to shut up and sit down, go somewhere. He should not be supported, period, by our community, period. He's ignorant. Heavenly, highly ignorant. And then he, he says things that people don't challenge his dumb ass on and it doesn't have any relevance, any relationship to us here. But he always try to pinpoint things to slavery, slavery, slavery. That idiot has not traveled to the other side of the Atlantic and studied black civilization in the Atlantic. I stated before, once the empire started falling off, or well, even when we were warred amongst ourselves, as well as when the the Europeans came over here. Many of them were black conquistadors when they came over here. They helped, they worked together with the very different tribes who could not stand the Incas or the Mayans. They helped when they were when they were trying to, when they was destroying those empires. A lot of those black people fled in different directions. A lot of them fled to Pacific, like that book just said. A lot of them fled to over to Africa. And they warned they had very different tribal fractions over today going on in Africa. Because a lot of those Negroes from here fled there. Some of them went to Europe, they just fled all over the, the all over the um, the planet. Like I said, some went to Pacific, some went to uh, went to the southern part of the United States and mixed in with the different Aboriginal tribes there. Some went to like I said to West Africa, some went over to East Africa, some went up to Central Africa, and some of them went over to North Africa, and some of them went to um, Asia, and then some of them went into Europe. It was they were moving, they was fleeing out of here because it was. Things are being destroyed and empires are coming down. I've been studying this for years, man. I don't listen to people like Boomer Johnson. I'll tell you, brother and sister, do your own damn research. The information is there. It's right in front of your face. But you're going to have to do some work. You can't just Google it. And that's what a lot of these idiots are doing. They Google it and you listen to people like Ron Kittles and idiots like uh, Lewis Henry Gates and these other morons. Who continue to just go by, oh, DNA says this, DNA says that, DNA says this. The people that they're using to, to determine the so-called Native American in this country are nothing but Siberian Asians. That's what they're doing. They're not, they're not looking at the history, the oral history, and realize who originally over here. And what was being described over here were the Aboriginal blacks who wore feathers. And turbans. So I'm trying to get brothers and sisters to understand that. So learn your history. Love your history. Master your history. Understand your history. Comprehend your history. Take back your history. And tell people like Umar Johnson and Sarah, Sarah Susan Seti to shut the hell up and go to hell. Peace and love.